Okay, so I'm going to talk about dependencies. I did watch the video, although I don't really remember, Olivia, what you talked about last week. <laughs> um, That's fine. I mean, dependency a bit, but not too much. Mostly like, you know, uh, description file and stuff like that. Yeah. And it I was like, just... and let's say like, you can sum it up as like, uh, basically like, what are the kind of directory you see? that we will not see in this book. For yeah. example, like the compiled code and stuff. Oh, uh, yeah. OK. It's, um, yeah. I, I don't think this is updated, unfortunately. I only just did the pull request like five minutes ago. <laughs> um, no, you can, you can show if you want like your, uh, you can. Yeah, so you should that. be able to see the notes just, OK. Um, what was I going to say? So yeah, so they just restructured the book like last week. And now the dependencies are in two chapters, chapter 11 and chapter 12. Um, and I'll just see how far I get. I started going through chapter 12 and I have some notes. So we'll, we'll see. So chapter 11 is about the mindset and background of dependencies. And basically this chapter is about deciding when you should take on a dependency they are sort of you don't want to have an all or nothing mindset you don't want to have all the dependencies but you don't want to necessarily have zero um, so this is kind of a going through the different um, factors and how you decide okay and th they make this note that you should revisit this. This chapter might not make sense to us specifically, you know, people like me, I've never made a package yet. I'm trying to get into the workflow and you should revisit this as you get more ambitious and sophisticated in your development. Okay, so the first section, set of sections is about when you should take a dependency. This section is adapted from a blog post and talk by Jim Hester, who I think is one of the maintainers of R, right? I, uh, he's an R guy. I know that much. Yeah, he was, he was like uh, on Posita Studio team for a long time. And I think he worked for, I think Airbnb, but I could be wrong. Okay, I, okay. I didn't uh, um, read this blog, but it seemed pretty similar to the book. So the first section, says dependencies are not equal and what makes them not equal there are different factors that affect the cost of adding a dependency so the different costs are one the type so if you're going to depend on a package if it's a base package right it will have a lower cost than um something that's not a base package because most users will have base packages on their system and you might be able to assume they have those. Um, a non-CRAN package would have a higher cost because there's more work involved in getting it installed for a user. The second thing is the number of upstream dependencies. So if you depend on a package that depends on another package that depends on another package, you have these recursive dependencies um, and they can be quite large. Three as already fulfilled dependencies. So if you say maybe instead of, if you do have a recursion, right, um, then it's lower cost to depend on other packages in that tree, right? So like if you depend on Deeplier, which depends on maybe I think Arlang, having those two, it doesn't really change the cost um, because Deeplier depends, it's in the same tree. Um, and again, if you depend on something that's highly downloaded, it's more likely the user might already have that. The installation burden. So if the package needs to have compiled code, like something like um, with C++, if you need to um, install from binary, if it has a large package size, I think it mentioned some bioconductor packages like five gigabytes or something crazy <laughs> um, and system requirements. So like I work in Bayesian modeling, there's some packages like JAGS that require you to also have JAGS software installed on your computer um, to use the R JAGS package. <clears throat> 
and then maintenance capacity. So will the package you depend on be regularly maintained? So this is a kind of, you have to have trust in these other people you wanna maybe check and see, are they updating it? Are they still active? Because if they have a bug, then you will have a bug and you might not be able to fix it. Um, but on the flip side, right, functionality, you could save a lot of time by outsourcing um, a broadly used function. So if you use something in the base or and they, they kind of treat Arlang as a base. So if you use a function from one of those packages, you will save time by just outsourcing and using it, using a dependency, then maintaining your own function and its bugs. Some of the um, recommendations they have for uh, evaluating these costs are like looking at the issues on GitHub. If you're trying to do something similar, you can see what's coming up. How much work will you have to put in if you decide to write your own function? Okay. So they say to prefer this holistic, balanced, and quantitative approach. So that these three things. So holistic, that means who is the primary audience? So if you're writing a function for data analysis or a method, you are probably most likely targeting users. And it's likely that those users will already have a lot of packages installed on their computer. You uh, probably can have more dependencies. Then say, for instance, if you're making a package for other developers, they might have maybe a more trim system and they might not have as much um, installed. Um, balanced. So there's a trade-off between adding a dependency. So some of those costs we talked about, install time, disk space maintenance, uh, typo here, compared to removing a dependency. So if you don't depend on a package, that means your package might have fewer features and you might have to do more development on your end and more maintenance um, of bugs and stuff like that. And then quantitative, you can actually use some packages like this one, it depends and pack to get a number of how heavy a dependency is. So like how uh, there was um, a little screenshot in the book of how much memory it might take. Yeah, let's see some of the things. So pack, if you say you wanna depend on Tibble, it will give the whole tree of other dependencies and it will say how much memory um, it will take to download and things like that. Okay. Then there's a specific section on the tidyverse. So you should never ever depend on the tidyverse or dev tools as these are sort of um, just a bundle of different packages. So instead you should figure out which function in the tidyverse or dev tools belongs to which package. So say for example, you want to use read underscore CSV and then you would just only depend on read R because that's where that function lives. Um, because Tidyverse and DevTools have very large recursive dependencies, they have dependency trees of greater than or equal to 100 packages. <laughs> that, so if you do depend on these packages, this would sort of require your user to have all of those packages. Um, but they do recommend some, as I mentioned, Arlang, some free low level tidy dependencies. So these are packages that um, are very broad in their functionality and they're very trim in terms of they don't like have a lot of recursion. So this, the Arlang, um, the CLI and glue. So this is about like gluing name, variable names and, and evaluating things like that with R. We've seen this one before. I don't remember. I don't remember what a lot of these do. With R and then life cycle. I actually don't know what that one is. Um, it says, let me see. So Life cycle is for managing the life cycle of functions and arguments. Oh, that must be the, where it has like the, those flags on the help pages, you know, on Tidyverse when it says like deprecated and those sorts of things. Um, okay, 
And if you do your R command check on your package, it will give you a note. And remember, we we don't we want to kind of, notes won't stop us, but we should get rid of all of our, these notes. Um, and it will give you a note if you have more than twenty non default package dependencies. So that's I guess a good rule of thumb. Okay. So once you decide you want to use a package an external package in your code, in your package, you need to decide how you want to use it. And so this next section is on whether you want to import it or suggest it. So imports and suggests are two sections of the description file, I believe. Um, so if you list a package under imports, that means it must be present in your user's computer at runtime. So it will automatically install anything that's missing on your use the user's computer um, and it will check on your own computer right so if you are using your package and you use load all it'll check to make sure you have all the imports it only installs it does not attach the package so if you only list a package in the description file and imports um, in your r code you should use this syntax package double colon function. And if we get, we should be able to get to it. I have some notes from the next chapter on the difference from the namespace file. Okay, suggests means uh, your package can use these packages, but it doesn't require them. So that means it's not gonna check if it's installed on the system. And so this is kind of a quote I took from the book. It isn't terribly relevant if your package sort of has a small scope, right? So if your user base is approximately equal to the development team, or it's sort of for internal use, um, or it's a very specific purpose. Because um, remember, they say your package will probably be used for something you never imagined it to be used for. If uh, So if that is not the case, if it has a very, very specific use, um, you can probably use suggests. So as I mentioned, it doesn't automatically install these packages when it's in, um, in, installed. You likely will want to list packages here that are only used for development tasks, um, used in tests or vignettes or rarely needed packages or something that's very tricky, right? That has a very high, um, cost in one of those options that we talked about earlier. So maybe you have um, in your vignette, you make some plots, So you, but you only make your plots in the vignette. So you might suggest ggplot2 instead of importing it. Okay. We'll go to the next page. Ah, sorry. Next page section. Okay. Here's some motivation now talking about the namespace. So this is a section about learning about namespaces. So the namespace provides context. So just not the file, just what is a namespace. Namespace provides context for looking up value of an object associated with a name. Um, one example, right, is this double colon operator. If we list the package that gives the explicit content text of where to find the, um, the object. And so if you are just working in your interface in R, the first namespace it looks in is the global environment. And then it looks in sequence of the most recently um, attached library to the oldest attached library. So you can see on the left, we first attached Luberday and then here. And so when we just call the function here, R looks in the most recently attached package, which is here. And it uses here, double colon here. On the right-hand side, if you do it the opposite way, it looks in the most recently attached package. And Luberday also has a function name here. So here we have a um, conflict naming conflict. This is one reason why they recommend you to always use this syntax, because then you explicitly know which namespace R will look in for an object called function. 
um, when you have dependencies in all of your code in your package below your R directory. Um, this saves us from potential user redefinition of functions as well. So if a user um, overrides here, say you want to depend on Lubridate, the user names an object here, um, it won't mess up anything that happens in your package. The namespace file is a special file. Um, here's an example. Hey, yeah, what's up, Ryan? Yeah, just going back on that last colon colon thing. <clears throat> I think it was in this book. I was reading that um, the um, the colon colon operator slows your code down by like a mic like six microseconds or something like that, or some really small unit of time. And it it's usually not an issue, but if you call it a million times, for example, he said, you know, then it starts slowing it down. So I had I had to make a decision about whether to use that for a specific function, and it was a base function. Actually, that was a question I had um, when I read this chapter before it was rewritten. I haven't reread re it since. Is should we be using like base colon colon? Is it for all packages or is it just for anything that's not in the you know regular install? Yeah, that's um, not a good question. It's not in this section. It's in if we get to it. It's in chapter twelve. Um, so chapter twelve has a section explicitly on when would you want to deviate from the syntax. And one of them is what you mentioned. It's like 100 nanoseconds slower to do this, colon, colon. Um, so I can maybe just jump to it right now because it doesn't really matter. So yeah, it's in chapter 12. Um, so here, so if you list the package in imports, um, you have to use this functionality, right? This avoids importing the entire package to your namespace. It easily lets you identify functions that live outside of your package and it eliminates name conflicts. These are all the, con the pros of using this. But like you said, there are exceptions. So when might you not want to do that? is you can't um, do the colon colon operator on another operator. So like the like addition or even the colon, uh, McGritter pipe, things like that. If you use a function a lot, so maybe that's something you use from base, they say that's an acceptable, well, in their like pedagogy or whatever you call this philosophy, um, that makes code more readable and it makes error messages easier for users. Um, and then, yeah, this is what you mentioned. If you have a loop, you do have a performance penalty. So if you have like a million iterations or something, you will really notice that's what they, um, and so if you want to make the exception, you can put the import in the namespace file. So you can do this, use import from, this will put a tag and it will put the import in the namespace file, which is different from just having the import in the description. Um, then you have to choose where you wanna put this import tag and the third option is you can actually import an entire package namespace. So use import from will just import the function, but you could also import the entire package. Um, this is the least recommended and most rare. <laughs> um, yeah. So definitely recommend checking out chapter 12. All right. Any other questions about that? I just, there's a, um, a library called Conflicted, um, which I, I guess you probably wouldn't use in package development, but I found quite handy for things like that, where you just have like one function you want to use. Um, you can specify that function and say, use this package over that package kind of thing, so you can be explicit. Oh, yeah, nice. 
Okay, so this is what I was saying um, just a minute ago. So we saw in the description file, let me go back, you import like this in the description file. And that does not add, that doesn't, that only um, installs, right? But it does not attach. If you want to attach, right? Which means you don't have to use this. You would use these in your namespace file. So import rlang attaches all of the functions, everything in rlang, the entire package namespace. Import from only imports the function read lines from the package Brio. Um, so these are the two things that you could use um, instead of this syntax. So the namespace file, um, each line we say can, these functions are called directives. Um, so basically is directing our, on how to build like where these things come from, I suppose. Um, these are the most common ones. So export, this will export a function from your package. Um, S3 methods, export an S3 method. So that's like when you have like print dot, uh, you know, vector, you know, you know, if you read advanced R, like a lot of the base functions like printing, plotting, um, it's like plot dot, and then it will have the object type, the S3 type, right? Plot dot data frame, plot dot matrix. Um, that's like a S3 method. Import from will import a selected object from another namespace. So it could be a function or I guess a data, a data set. <clears throat> Import imports all objects from another package's namespace into your package. And I apologize for all these typos. <laughs> and then used in lib registers routines from a database lab. Someone who works with databases probably knows this better. A library, dynamic library. I looked this up, I forgot already. Um, Dynamic link library. <laughs> okay. So each line here, so you'll notice this says, do not edit your namespace file by hand. And it won't stop you, right? Like I've done it. I've edited it by hand because I, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> um, but you, to use, when you use our oxygen too, it will just update it for you. Um, and how it updates it is from these namespace tags. And these tags are in your um, R files under your R directory. You only need to learn the export tag and then um, R oxygen 2 figures out the specific directive. So it takes away the burden of writing namespace from you, right? You don't have to think about what order do I wanna put it in? What directive do I need? You only need to learn one thing, how to write the tags, and then um, R Oxygen 2 will write your namespace file for you in a neat and tidy way. And that will save you time because this book is all about efficiency. <laughs> okay. So when we're talking about namespaces, we also want to talk about the search path and why this is more motivation for why we need to think about namespaces. So so again, not the file, but namespace as in where does R look for things when you call them by a name. So if you are a user, where does R look? So if you are just using R interactively, where will it look when you call something by a name? Well, first it will look in the global environment then it will look in the package namespaces that have been attached um, in like the reverse order, like we saw before. So the most recent to the oldest. Um, then it will look in auto loads. I, I actually am not super familiar with auto loads. And then the last thing it will look in is base environment. So you can see from number two, if you, attach another package, it changes your search path. Um, but this does not apply when you are developing your package code. 
So what happens if you are in your package and you ask R to find something by its name? Um, so this is from the advanced R book chapter on environments. So there are two environments in the package. One is the package environment, which is the ex inter external interface, um, which whose parent is determined by the search path and exposes exported objects. So this is what the user interacts with, right? So the package environment gets added into this search path of the user. The second is the namespace environment. This is the internal interface, including all objects in the package. Every namespace environment, um, so when you're in a package, it has a, a dependable order that you can always depend on. Um, and the environment always has the same parents or ancestors. First is the imports environment, which is controlled by the namespace file. Then it's the base namespace, base environment bindings, and then it's the global environment last. So let's look at this figure. Um, they have a lot of these in the advanced R book, this little bullet here. So X um, is a object, I believe. So if you are in a package, you're in this top row. If you are in a user, you're in this bottom row. So this says, if I am a user and I call the SD function, the standard deviation function, um, it's not in my global environment. It finds it in the stats package. They both point to, I believe this is like the address or the memory address. This is like breaking my computer science knowledge here, but the, this lives in the same spot, but the order that it finds it is different. If I am in the package namespace or stats package, standard deviation lives there. So if I call standard deviation when I'm inside the package, um, it's up in here. If it doesn't find it, Right, it keeps going and this is the order. So if I'm in a package, it first looks in my own package namespace, then it looks in the packages that I import, then it looks in um, the base namespace, then the last thing it looks in is the global environment. So this kind of saves you from users overriding <laughs> um, your functions. And that's why if a user Call, it overwrites your function variants. It doesn't break your your function actually because um, when standard deviation in the stats package calls variants, it looks in this order. Does that make sense? Okay, these are complicated graphics and they use them a lot in the advanced R book. Um, so if you haven't read it, I highly recommend reading it <laughs> and in the in this R packages book they build up to it a little bit more um I just only included the last one because it was more comprehensive okay oh I see some chat going sorry I'm not looking at it how do I see it I can't even see the chat oh uh, the little brother just like link it like to a quick google stack overflow on auto load Oh, on auto load. Define it. Oh, I see. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's the pointer, but I'm not sure. Easy. Yeah. Okay. Let's target the space in the memory, the address in the memory, exactly. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you. But uh, I'm sure if it does. Okay. The last thing is about um, the difference between attaching and loading. So I kind of was alluding to this earlier. Um, we want to get technical about our <laughs> semantics in this book, although in real life, we don't usually make these differentiations. So if a package is installed, loading makes a package available in memory, but it's not added to the search path. Attaching puts the package in the search path. So technically, the library function loads and then attaches the package. So it does both. Um, 
there are four functions that make a package available. So, and there are differences, right, in whether they only load or whether they attach. And then the other thing they differ in is whether they throw an error if they can't find the package or if they return false, right? So if you throw an error, it, it stops your code. If you return false, you can interact and, and use it. So library is down here, right? It attaches the package X and it throws an error if it can't find the package X. Require will attach a package X, but it will return a false if it doesn't find X. Require namespace only loads the package, and then load namespace also only loads a package. Um, library, right? I I think most of us we use it all the time. It's great when you during doing data analysis or when you're writing your vignettes. If you want to um, specify different behavior based on whether or not a package is installed, you can use this require namespace. Um, the other two. These two are unlikely to be needed uh, in generic situations, is what they say. Um, okay, so whether to import or depend on a package. So imports we saw before, make sure it guarantees the user will have that package installed, right? So it'll be available in memory, it's loaded. Depends, make sure that the package will also be attached. So they say that they favor imports over depends, right? As we talked about before, we don't want our package necessarily to have um, behavior that changes the global environment of a user, right? So if we use depends, it will attach the package and it will change a user's search path. All right, that's chapter 11. It's kind of, uh, I think there's one more. Oh, yeah, that's the old videos. I have some, I have the beginning of chapter 12, and then we can discuss. I think, Neil, maybe you'll have to pick up where I left off. Um, so chapter 11, yeah, was a lot of motivation and kind of nitty gritty. And chapter 12 is more about, um, in practice, the practical details of working with dependencies how to use dependencies in your functions, tests, examples, vignettes, and articles. And the first section is just clarifying confusion about imports. So I kind of tried to make this clear in the previous chapter, but if you list an import in your description file, um, the package only needs to be installed in order to work. Um, wait, the description file lists the packages that your package needs to work, but it does not import the package. Okay, I'm sorry. Imports make sure that the package is installed, but it does not make functions available to you or your user. So, it, right, it doesn't attach. Packages that are listed in imports do not need to appear in the namespace file but every package in your namespace file must appear in the description file in either the imports or depends. Uh, so there's a stricter relationship here. Um, okay, I think it's a little bit clear from what we talked about the behavior. So here's a general workflow, I believe, unless... I'm missing something. Um, no, that's it. Okay, so the namespace file will keep track of how and when to import functions from another package and export functions from your package. It's generated from those tags that I mentioned before in your um, .r files in your R directory. Those tags, um, start with comments explaining the R2 oxygen generation and it, they need to be regenerated periodically. Let me pull up the book really quick and just show the, the uh, the little code that they have. 
So this is what they mean. So when you um, generate your namespace file with our oxygen, I guess we saw this already. It will start with this snippet of code um, and don't, you know, don't change it. <laughs> okay. So the general workflow is you will add one of these tags, the at export um, or at import from or one of these at tags. You'll add one of these in your R files and then R oxygen 2 will just read these tags and update your namespace file accordingly. They'll, it'll figure it out for you. Um, so when you add the tags, in order to get the document updated, you run DevTools document and it'll update um, both the help and the namespace file. Okay. And this is what, I think this is the last section I got to in the, this chapter. So packages, uh, a package is listed in imports can mean you are allowed to assume it is installed wherever your package is installed. This is what we talked about before. If your package is, in, is listed in imports, how do you use it in code below your R directory? So this is what we talked about before. You can use this syntax. If you don't wanna use the syntax, you can import the function. Um, and then the last resort is importing an entire package. And actually that's as far as I got. This is old, this is old notes. So that's all I have for today. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. I, I have seen it like the import, the load, even not more than importing, like loading the, when you load a package, that it's load another package. Like there's, a, I think at least few packages that do that, like they miss a site, like a package, and they basically tell you like when you when you load the package that they are loading another package. I think I have I have seen that at least twice or minimum. So it exists. Like yeah. Obviously, we should not maybe do this, but <laughs> yeah, it exists. Yeah. Cool. This is a, a interesting interesting section. Um, so Neil, yeah, so Neil, I only got to, I stopped at 12.2, I guess. <laughs> so maybe we need to, I can talk to John, um, shift the calendar. Cause I think the rest of chapter 12 is like still quite a bit of stuff. So you probably will not do, want to do two chapters. <laughs> I can have a, a look. Um, I haven't through chapter twelve yet, so yeah. But we might be uh, when, So we've got next week, and then after that, uh, why are we up the calendar? Uh, next week, yeah, you have some next week, so you have you, and then after the other week, we have like uh, Howard. uh, awards for testing basic, yeah. And I assume, like, uh, and after it's not set, yeah, after it's not, but we have a bit of time, it's fine, yeah. We are we are doing good, like, we are progressing, yeah, yeah. How's everyone's package development? I'll be honest, I uh. Ryan posted his thing on Slack and I was like, I'm gonna get my workflow going. And I'm like made the GitHub project and that was like about it. That's as far as I got. <laughs> that counts, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's the beginning. Yeah. I have built one, but just for like a um, job to take home assignment for a job. Yeah. So more like as an exercise. It was I was like pleasantly surprised. Yeah. It was super easy, like the, uh, like I have said previously, like the load all and uh, um, check, like uh, it's it's addictive. I think I will even like you know build a job to like uh, change them, like you know you want like to 
document, I think then you want to, um, I think it's check and then you want to load everything. So I think I will like just make a small script today. So I can run, run it like uh, mm -hmm. on the background instead of on my uh, R session, but yeah. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, 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 I feel it's uh, way easier than I assume. Also at least they make it easier. Yeah. So I, it, I think it's easier when you start small also. And maybe that's not the case of your package because what you mentioned, it was like an already write and stuff. And then you have like to. Yeah. I probably, I probably should just um, add my stuff to that pack package. And then it'll be easier because I know that that other, that student will not maintain it. So I should probably just take it over and not have a dependency and just like <laughs> have it all in one. Um, otherwise, if I uh, want to use my code and have it, if I have it as a dependency, you, it'll have to be installed like from Git every time which might not be the easiest. I mean, it is a good question. Like if you are copy pasting code, uh, what's the, what's like the etiquette of it? Like you can also like, you know, go to GitHub, copy paste the code and put that under your package. I, I do not know if it's like, uh, if you have like some etiquette uh, about that or, I mean, oh, I mean as a prof as professional we are, but like, <laughs> I don't know. If yeah. I, I think there'll be a license you'd need to, you need to check. Yeah. Yeah, license. licensing. I think what would end up happening, like if I do take it far enough, is that yeah, he would get his name, like he would be listed as an author and get um just not be a maintainer. <laughs> that works also. Um when so when I was speaking of my pack the package that I was working on. Um, when I was working on it, there were a couple of things I ran into that were rel relevant to today that I just wanted to briefly mention. Um, so I don't know if y'all are familiar with the data.table package. Anybody familiar with it a little bit? Um, well, uh, I'm, I'm not a pro at data.table. Uh, I am still figuring my way out, figuring my way through that package. The reason I'm using it is because it does calculations faster than dplyr and um, uh, base r. Uh, I think uh, Hadley wrote a couple of times once and then entirely rewrote the dt plier package, which essentially is a wrapper for data.table. Um, it allows you to use dplyr syntax, and then it converts the dplyr syntax, that code, into data.table code, and then just uses data.table. Um, it usually doesn't make sense to do that if you have a small data set, but if with a large data set, it's pretty useful. Anyway, so uh, skipping to data.table, it has some weird arguments. There's, for example, uh, colon equals um, is, I think it's a symbol that or an operator that's defined in there. It has dot n dot s s d. Um, and uh, it would, my code would run, it would compile with, uh, without, doing import data.table or import from data.table or something, something, whatever that thing was. Um, but it kept giving me warnings. And I don't know if, how y'all feel about warnings, but I try really hard to change my code. So there are no warnings. It makes me feel better about myself. Um, so, and I just checked, uh, I have no import packages. I've only done import from. So I felt good after hearing uh, Torin uh, talk about all that. Um, but yeah, so I had to do import import from to declare those. I think I think they're operators. They look like operators or something. But um, that was a weird weird thing I ran into. The other weird thing that I ran into is I wanted to put my middle name in the author fields of the. It's like one of the first things you do when you're setting up a package. Um, and the way that the name function works in base R, I think it's base R. Um, or maybe it's utils, one of the two. Um, there is like a preferred way, which is now to use like family and given name, like people from 
China, for example, their first name is their family name and their last name is their uh, given name. So it's to avoid the confusion, you just use given and family. That way it works for everybody. So the old way used to be, you know, first, middle, last. Um, so I want to put my middle name in there and it wouldn't let me. It was like, no, this is an outdated, outdated way of doing it. And I could not figure out how to change it. Um, I think what they want you to do is to, to put your middle name in the given section. So just do mine is Ryan Patrick Alexander. So I put Ryan Patrick Alexander in the given section. I have two middle names. Um, Anyway, sorry, small detail, but oh. if you. <laughs> so what did you end up doing? You put them all in the give in the given. I I just caved and put them all in given. I wanted to like put an issue on Cran or something like that, or not Cran on GitHub or some some place where someone would pay attention to it. But I was like, you know what? This is not, I'm this is not a hill worth dying on. So I'm just <laughs> gonna leave it alone. I mean, yeah. we can ask it as a question for Jenny's. <laughs> Remember, we have this homework, and uh, yeah. Uh, let me think if, like, I have an example of like some uh, authors that want maybe, like, you know, there's some famous authors that want also his middle name. You're maybe not the only one, like, with this uh, with this problem. I mean, I have a I have very basic French name. Like, there's probably hundred of people that have the same. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's also like I have a problem process also sometimes. But yeah. Yeah, I have two middle names as well. And one time my PhD advisor was like, that's a very British thing to have two middle names. And I was like, I don't know. It just happened. I have two. Well, my we uh, in Latin America we have always uh, two last names, uh, but my first my first last name what <laughs> I don't know my uh, my first last name is actually like uh, uh, it's two <laughs> last names uh, separated by uh, like a dash. So I re in I in practice I have three last names and it's awful <laughs> when trying to do official paperwork. Yeah, is it hard to like use your passport if you're traveling overseas? Yeah, nice. and especially when you when you have to open like new bank accounts and things like that, they because the 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 person in on in the counter always gets it wrong and so they put like a uh but uh, if you if you're married you have like a, a married last last name also so they put my third and I don't know it's really <laughs> complicated well at least at least I feel like it's less problematic on the air package that it could be like on the administrative where I also have two kids with um, like uh, my wife and my name and it doesn't work well between nationalities also so but uh, I guess like I can say sorry to them when they are building their our package <laughs> if like uh, a deception but it's bad like uh, that's uh, you can't like have your diversities inside of the of it I feel like it's a small stuff that shouldn't be problematic I mean you know that's your name it's not 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 big and I do not think like I don't know it's not huge like uh, just as in like a stuff of it an argument of it will not like be the hand of the world I feel I mean it will not break computers <laughs> anyway so that's it um yeah so we could um like i said like i i was said that last time like try to build a small package uh to me it was very helpful and then like uh to put crappy stuff into it uh i've made a lot, lot of mistake while doing that um I mean stupid mistake I, I just like figure it out very quickly but it will tell me memorize so this is something that we can we, we should tell maybe like to the author of the book that uh, maybe like uh, uh, some exercise with package would be good, um, and especially like because uh, we are they are very nice um, and they try to avoid us trouble, but sometimes it's also good to I feel to 
12 exercise. And I think we can, like, I remember uh, his, um, his book, like Advanced R. I have read it like long time ago, the first version. His exercise was very good at that. I remember him like, they are very good at, you know, I think you have understand, but no, do this exercise and oh my God. <laughs> I, I understand. So maybe some of exercise where you're building package and getting the warning, reading the warning and all to that can help. It's mine, I guess. It should, I, I think that gives some things that should be told to students a lot. Like, you know, uh, if you have a warning, it's not the end of the world. Uh, and uh, if you have like an error, it's not the end of the world. Read it carefully. It's, uh, and the computer will not bite you. I mean, hopefully, not now. <laughs> Maybe later. You had to Google on, you know, Stack Overflow and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, just or, or, or ask like uh, artificial intelligence or whatever is, is like the authority now. But yeah, that's it. That was my recommendation. You can think about it. Oh, if you I had a look at that um, thing you posted as well, and if you have the uh, the Bayesian um, statistical rethinking or something like that. Oh yeah, I had yeah. A look, a couple of those um, of his lectures are quite interesting. Yeah, I, I was lucky to uh, be selected last year, uh, not at the level for this course. I feel uh, no, maybe I could, um, but yeah, he's very good teachers and very good like. Um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, uh, it's, yeah, it's very good pedagogy. I don't know if it's correct English word, but yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah so um, I think I want to redo it uh, this year. I, I am not applying for uh, auditing the course because I graduate from it with probably bad grade, but <laughs> manage it. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, so I want to redo it maybe. Uh, this year with others like uh, we can be a book club i think they have done it uh, for others like uh, for it's clear like richard mark alvarez is a professor at leipzig is famous in the bayesian world i think and he is doing a lecture every year on his book and uh, you can uh, and i wanted like to say we can have a book club on it um, that's why like um, but uh, i think it's very difficult to do two le two lectures per week that's basically because to like at my speed, it could be like one day, one day and a half to do the exercise. So, and one full day. Maybe now I will be like, if, if you want to do like, so it's watching something like three hours of video <laughs> and yeah. read two chapters of books, which uh, obviously is a good writer, uh, but um, it's still costly, I feel. Yeah. But yeah, if you are interested, we can. We can, we can, we can maybe do it again. Yeah, maybe a slow pace or something. It's like a, it's an hour and forty, like one of his lectures. Yeah. Oh, that's a, it's a chunk of. Uh, of what yeah, it's, it's very. I think I learned also a lot uh, from this lecture on how to do a good lecture. Version. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I was. Uh, it was ah okay. I will get. I you know. I will just accept this fact and not understand everything. But yeah. uh, on the way, like he was teaching, I learned a lot also. So that is, but yeah, I don't know. What does I think about that? Yeah, because like some of you are teaching stats, so. <laughs> yeah, I went to an orientation for teaching last week and they said like, a uh, student, I mean, you can only pay attention for like 12 minutes or something. So you have to like have planned breaks. So like you talk for like 10 minutes, then you say, okay, do this. Yeah, exercise. you do that. <laughs> you, do, you do that in this uh, one hour and 40 minutes, like you include various break uh, of different kind. Like, uh, and it's very well done. Like it's, it, uh, I, you know, it's like, when you are like at this level of teaching, you probably just have one course, you know, per year. You probably do a bunch of research and academic job, I mean, uh, uh, administrative job, but like you just have one course. I mean, maybe it has more, but it's just like, you know, it's kind of, the, you know, the staff course of this institute. So it, yeah, it's probably like some help to organize everything. And, but yeah, it's very well done. And uh, yeah, 
I if um yeah. Also is I don't know, he's funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. Well, thanks so much. Yeah. Um Neil, I put the section in the the Google Sheet. So if you forget, where is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I've jotted it down as well. Yeah. I'll take yeah. a take a look at it tonight. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. The only thing I'm not sure about is um whether I'll be back by the 28th. I think I'll still be hiking. Um so I don't know if that will mess things up for anyone. Um in terms of doing like the licensing one as well. I mean, just just oh uh, it should be okay. Mm. Yeah, just send a message on the chat and that's it. Cool, cool. Yeah, it yeah, it, it'll be okay. Watch it on YouTube and that's increase of fame in YouTube. <laughs> yeah. We'll figure it out. Yeah. No All right. Bye Thank everyone. You so See you Bye. next week. Yeah.